In May of 1995, a deranged local named Sean Nelson ripped through the city of San Diego, leaving chaos and destruction in his wake. And the way he executed this was truly unique. Flattening the city with an M60A3 tank, San Diego was at the mercy of his firepower. And how he managed to even find such a thing in the first place is nothing short of remarkable. The surveillance footage caught during his escapade makes for some truly unbelievable viewing, with hundreds of thousands tuning in to watch the rampage unfold. But who exactly was Sean Nelson? Why was he hellbent on destroying San Diego? And how would this chaos finally be stopped? Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a case that's so bizarre it'll leave you thinking about it for days. So, does anyone here remember Killdozer? Because ever since covering that case around two years ago, I've had so many requests to cover this one. And of course, at the end, we'll compare the two. Coffeehouse Crime is all about true crime, strange, and chilling stories, and the best way to support me is by subscribing to this channel. So, if you like darkly fascinating stories, or stories like this one, then please remember to subscribe now. By the way, I've got some really exciting news coming up, but for now I can't actually tell you about it, it's classified. Saying that, if you want to be the first person to hear about it, then head on over to coffeehousecrime.com and sign up. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Sean Nelson. Welcome to the Golden State, folks, also known as California. Home to both Silicon Valley and Hollywood, there truly is something for everyone here. The Golden Gate Bridge will surely be at the top of anyone's visit list. And if you're a true crime buff, then how could you not check out the famous island prison of Alcatraz? For those budding sommeliers out there, it is a must to wander around the Napa Valley, an absolute hotbed for wine production and its history. Even those who have never set foot on American soil will have heard of California's most popular cities. Massive icons like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Sacramento. For today's video, we're heading down to San Diego in 1995. With a population of around 1.1 million people at the time of this case, its location on the Pacific coast makes it a hotspot destination for many surfers and sea sports sports enthusiasts. Life back then was totally different to what we are used to nowadays. Bill Clinton was president, the case of OJ Simpson gripped the nation, Brad Pitt was new to the show business scene, and there was no such thing as social media. Imagine a time where people just had to speak to each other to hang out. 1995 was the year that many internet titans were founded, including Yahoo and eBay. And although an early bunch highly anticipated the release of Windows 95, the world hadn't yet realised just how enormous the internet would become. America saw several big stories during this time frame. Kevin Mitnick was arrested for hacking into the country's most secure internet systems, and famous singer Selena Quintanilla was murdered by her number one fan Yolanda Saldivar. Yolanda was the president of her fan club, and was recently fired after being caught embezzling money from the club. Yes, 1995 really was filled with many dramatic events, one of which we'll be getting into in just a few moments. But first, allow me to introduce you to the main man of our video today, and his name was Sean Timothy Nelson. Born on August the 21st, 1959, to Bessie and Fred Nelson, Sean was raised in the Claremont area of San Diego alongside his two brothers. He attended James Madison High School before graduating in 1978. With no real plan on what to do, but wanting some sort of reliant structure to his life, Sean enlisted in the US Army. He underwent training at Fort Knox in Kentucky, before eventually being stationed in Western Germany in a tank division. But Sean's time here was not actually too peachy. After serving only two years in the military and what they described as multifaceted disciplinary problems, he was honorably discharged in the year 1980. Now, technically, he separated from the army, which is a term used to describe leaving active duty, but not the military in its entirety. He returned to Claremont in 1980, and when he finally did, he found love in a familiar face. Susie Hellman was a friend he had known from high school, and when the two did eventually hit it off, they married four years later in 1984. The couple would have a comfortable life together for six long years. Where Susie was a legal secretary, Sean had now become a plumber. The two bought their own house, and basically had life made. The house they shared was on Williamet Avenue in the neighbourhood of Claremont, San Diego. However, by the early 90s, things were starting to go wrong for Sean in a number of separate ways. Sadly, his mother passed away in 1988, and four years later, in 1992, his father also died. 
In between these two traumatic events, other issues became more prominent. In 1990, Sean was involved in a motorbike accident. As a result, he suffered serious injuries to his neck and back that required care at the Sharp Memorial Hospital. Sadly, even his procedure didn't seem to be something straightforward. During his time here, he attempted to discharge himself from the hospital, which actually resulted in him getting into a physical fight with one of the security guards. Sean would later go on to separate two separate lawsuits against the hospital, the first being a whopping $1.6 million on the grounds of negligence, assault, battery, and false imprisonment, and the second, well, just for malpractice. Though, rightfully so, both lawsuits were dismissed in 1993. To rub salt in the wound, the judge granted the hospital's counter-lawsuit in 1994, which therefore ordered Sean to pay $6,600 in legal costs and medical expenses. Somewhat explanatory to his behaviour, but Sean had slipped into an erratic world of drug and alcohol abuse. The man was spiralling out of control with methamphetamine and booze, becoming more dishevelled week by week. Susie would ultimately have enough and late that year filed for divorce. There was no denying that Sean's behaviour was becoming stranger by the day, and while most neighbours never actually spoke to him, they were all aware of him and his odd activities. To begin with, Sean would mow his lawn in the middle of the night, and his backyard was littered with pieces of machinery in various states of disrepair. In fact, the police were called to his property more than nine times over the course of two years due to dozens of noise complaints. This would lead him to file even more lawsuits, not just against the police, but even the city council itself. To add to this, he was kind of obsessed about minerals in his backyard, I mean, he would always say to neighbours that he was planning on selling his property for millions of dollars, because apparently he had oil and gold underneath his property. This wasn't just theoretical, by the way. I mean, he would literally begin to dig a mine more than 20 feet deep. It is unknown where he got this idea from, but it is worth noting here that during this time frame, he was becoming more and more addicted to both alcohol and methamphetamine. Sean proceeded to dig a mine into his backyard, descending more than 20 feet. To further facilitate his operation, he converted his perfectly usable jacuzzi into a sluice box, which, for those who don't know, is a contraption used to separate gold in any mining operation. While his friends and acquaintances confirmed that he talked about gold a lot and spent countless hours digging, it seems as though his ventures always came back fruitless. And due to his tendency to work in the mine during nighttime hours, another factor that was possibly meth-related, he received numerous noise complaints by neighbours. And these were not the only complaints lodged either. Others included intense arguments with his roommates or girlfriends, and police attended his property in the summer of 1994, when his work van was robbed of all his plumbing tools inside. Everything seemed to be getting worse for Sean. Without his tools, he couldn't do his job or earn a living, and by all accounts, he was increasingly strung out on substances. By the time 1995 rolled around, he was really suffering for it. The backyard mining operation was, unsurprisingly, bringing in no money, and surprise surprise, his addictions had burned through all of his savings. His house was being foreclosed due to falling behind on payments, and an eviction notice had finally been served. His utilities had been shut off due to non-payment, and to top it all off, his girlfriend had split up with him and moved out of the house. Everything was boiling up for Sean, and tragically, all of this pressure would erupt in the most destructive way possible. May the 17th, 1995. Found five miles south of Sean's home, and behind an eight-foot chain-link fence lay the California National Guard Armory. Found behind this chain-link fence was an extensive range of equipment not currently used by the military. Staff usually finished work at around 6pm, but on this night, they were asked to work later than usual. Unknown to them at the time, a neighbour saw Sean leave his home several miles away in the evening, with Sean being described as shirtless and dishevelled. Jumping into his Chevrolet truck, he left his home towards the National Guard Armoury, his custom number plate a tribute to his general handiness, reading Can Fix. Arriving at the armoury, Sean drove inside and then approached a series of tanks. Since the gates were left open for the overtime staff, he actually managed to enter without raising any suspicions. Which is very worrying, because even after doing so, his presence remained unchallenged. Sean then stepped out of his truck, approached some of the tanks sitting nearby, and then tried to break into them. Now, each tank was secured with a single padlock on the access hatch, and after breaking the padlock on two separate tanks, he entered each one to find they couldn't be started. It was at that moment that, at 6.30pm, 
p.m., Sean spotted a Patton M60A3 tank. The M60A3 is widely used in various places across the globe, and is an extremely effective war machine. When fully loaded up and armed, it can weigh more than 57 tons. With a full tank of diesel, the M60A3 can cover almost 300 miles or 480 kilometers, achieving speeds in excess of 40 miles per hour or 64 kilometers per hour. And although this is low by any domestic vehicle driving standards, it feels a lot more intimidating thanks to its size. Developed in the mid to late 70s, the A3 made some technical improvements to the weapon system seen in the A2. However, as a general model, the M60 tank and all of its previous versions are one of the most widely used tanks in history. Over 15,000 units have been built since 1959, serving 26 other countries over the course of its use either in war or aid. And although it was retired from frontline duty by the US in 1991, many were still held by the National Guard across the country. When Sean broke the padlock and then accessed the M60A3, two things happened. The first is that Sean was now finally spotted by one of the guardsmen at the armory, but the second, and far more significant thing, is that the tank actually started. While the guardsmen knew that these tanks were stored without ammunition, he also knew that, once the hatch was closed and the tank had started, there was no way of getting Sean out. With that said, as the tank slammed out of the gate and into the neighborhood, military staff did the one thing they could do get the hell away, and call the police. And just like that, the streets of San Diego were plunged into an immediate state of chaos. At 6.30pm, Sean and his tank rolled out onto Mesa College Drive. Reports from witnesses seemed to indicate that the path of destruction was not entirely random, as Sean seemed to make all efforts in avoiding civilian casualties. The tank rumbled on while targeting city assets, taking out utility poles, traffic signs, and even a bus stop. During this time frame, an estimated 40 vehicles were crushed in the process. Civilians were absolutely stunned to see the tank rip through the city, with one or two unlucky enough to record the whole thing on camera. Sirens blared as civilians ducked behind cars, unsure if the turret was loaded or not. The tank then made its way onto the freeway, travelling on Interstate 805. While there, it made a sustained and deliberate attempt to knock down a concrete pedestrian bridge. And when this failed, the tank turned around and then continued to move. By this point, the chase was garnering nationwide coverage. TV channels across the US were tuning in to the chaos, interrupting regular shows regardless of their status. No surprise, but the general public were extremely alarmed to see military-grade vehicles on the highway, destroying absolutely everything in its path. Fire hydrants were decimated, spurting gallons of water into the street, and utility poles were crushed, knocking out power to more than 5,000 homes in the local area. After failing to destroy the bridge and now continuing down the freeway, Sean was being tailed by numerous police vehicles and helicopters. And by now, a very unsettling truth was becoming obvious to all. Not a single thing was readily available to the police force that could even begin to penetrate the tank's armour. The machine in which Sean had entombed himself in was designed to withstand this sort of confrontation and beyond. And so, there was simply nothing anyone could do. Now, there were two options available but neither of them were good for PR or safety. The first thing they could use were breaker bars. Self-explanatory, but a pair of bars designed to jam the cogs that ran the tank's tracks. But even finding a pair would take several hours. The second, even more worrying option was to fight fire with fire. A civilian had just captured a military-grade vehicle, and the only way to penetrate its armour is by using one back. Either that, or an airstrike from a military aircraft, which would be absolutely bonkers and probably end in casualty. Now, neither of these options sounded practical and were swiftly dismissed by the military, and so they were still left with this mammoth task of how to shut Sean and his rampage down. Speaking of which, Sean had now travelled both southbound and northbound on Interstate 805, destroying various utilities along the way. In a situation where there seemed to be no hope other than to tail the tank, law enforcement was about to catch their one and only lucky break. While travelling on California State Route 163, Sean attempted to cross the divider near Genesee Street. For safety reasons, the two sides of a freeway are divided by continuous and fairly solid concrete barriers. Sean moved the tank to cross these barriers, but unfortunately for him, ended up getting his tank stuck instead. The impact had completely removed one side of the tank's tracks, meaning it was now largely immobilized. Officers on the scene took this opportunity to jump onto the tank and then climb up towards the access hatch. One of those officers was named Paul Paxton, an army reservist with tank experience, and given his previous knowledge, he knew how to open the access hatch. That being said, if the hatch is 
combat locks had been secured from the inside, he would have never been able to gain entry. But surprisingly, Sean had actually forgotten to do this. The four officers revealed direct sight of Sean in the tank, and after yelling at him to stop, Sean tried to shift the machine backwards and forwards to wriggle it off the divider. In direct response, a single shot was fired by Richard Piner, hitting Sean between his neck and shoulder. With the bullet entering his torso, he immediately became incapacitated, and with that one single gunshot, Sean's rampage against San Diego was finally over. Sean was immediately dragged out of the tank to receive medical treatment, but despite their best efforts, his wound proved to be fatal, and he died in hospital later that evening. Ironically, it was the very one that he had filed two lawsuits against. Sean's aftermath would bring more than $150,000 in damages. 40 private vehicles were damaged, with some of them crushed beyond salvage, and this was alongside the countless utilities destroyed in his rampage. The California Guard was found to be negligent with its security measures, and bore the responsibility for the damage that was caused. The telecom company Pacific Bell were paid $10,000 for their service being disturbed. The city of San Diego was awarded $12,500, which mainly went to the repair and replacement of destroyed infrastructure, and more than $40,000 dollars was awarded to the local power supplier, San Diego Gas and Electric. The state would also go on to reimburse people who had their own personal property destroyed by the tank, which included crushed cars and damaged items. Additionally, repairs were made to the bridge and concrete divider that Sean damaged, not to mention the numerous hydrants, utility poles, and bus stops that he took out. Local residents were both amazed and terrified from the event, one saying, the guy was just going crazy. He was mowing cars over. It seemed he just wanted to get the utilities and cause as much damage without hurting people. After Sean's death, questions were raised asking if the use of deadly force was necessary, and some of his friends and relatives strongly believed he could have been stopped without being fatally shot. Police justified this by claiming they did not know if Sean was armed or not, and once they popped the hatch, he repeatedly ignored requests to surrender and continued to put officers' lives at risk. In addition to this, the threat to the public was so enormous that it was not worth the risk. His brother even agreed, saying, I don't want to say anything bad about the police, they were just doing their job. We are very sorry for all the damage done, and very thankful that no one was hurt. This incident, understandably, raised multiple concerns. The sheer ease in acquiring the tank was an ugly warning over security, and, as you can imagine, the military were very worried of seeing repeat rampages. With the National Guard Armory housing arsenals of military hardware and equipment, robbery of these items could prove to be disastrous when in the wrong hands, and it's clear to see that the security measures that were in place at the time were clearly unacceptable. In in response, new measures are put in place. In addition to heightened security measures, batteries inside dormant tanks are now removed and destroyed. This means even if someone broke the padlocks and then accessed the tanks, they would be incapable of starting them. Now, one of the enduring mysteries of this rampage is the motive itself, and I'm sure you're thinking that too, but the frustrating thing is, nobody is quite sure. There was no note left behind, no emotional events prior could be determined, and no warnings or threats were realised. It was mentioned in the aftermath that he had actually joked about ending his life with close friends, but this was not in a substantial or repeated manner. With this occurring in May of 1995, the Oklahoma bomb tragedy happened just one month prior. Apparently, he said to a neighbour that it was, quote, good stuff. So, there are questions if Sean actually supported domestic terrorism or not or if he was just being edgy. Now, there are several theories as to why Sean may have taken on San Diego in a tank, and of course, I've compiled all theories in this video. Some believe that Sean's injuries sustained from the motorbike accident may have triggered a concussion, which, as we know, can be responsible for changing behaviour. It is confirmed he had severe spinal and neck injuries, and this could have psychologically impaired or altered his behaviour. Saying that, there is no solid evidence that this happened, and without any repetitive injuries to his head, we can rule out chronic conditions such as CTE. Sean also felt like a scorned man. He had multiple arguments with the police, lost two lawsuits against the hospital, argued with neighbours all the time, lost his job, and divorced his wife. 
There is the possibility that he simply had enough, and wanted to go out in the most violent and destructive way possible. And with alcohol and meth constantly in his system, both of those things would have contributed to his impaired and flawed way of thinking. There is an agreed reality of his known substance abuse issues along with the understanding of how these drugs can affect a person. It is well known that alcohol can make people erratic and violent at times, as can the use of methamphetamine. When combined, they are well known to erode the mental stability of a person over time, and it seems as though this was likely a huge factor in the decisions that Sean made on that day. I mean, golden oil in the backyard. He was clearly going through some shit for a while already. There have also been more generic and less specific theories floating around. Perhaps Sean felt betrayed by the US Army and wanted to seek revenge. Or maybe he simply had enough with the council. The main theme that was present during Sean's rampage was one of revenge. Much like the case of Killdozer, he made deliberate efforts to go after every institution that he felt wronged him. The US military, the council, the police, and even the city itself. In addition to this, he had also voiced thoughts of ending his life due to the myriad of issues that he had. So, the reality is likely a combination of all of these issues mentioned. And as a result, he simply snapped. So, the big question is, if Sean were put against Killdozer, who would win? Now, on one hand, we have Sean Nelson and his M60A3. In terms of hardware, it should be noted that he had a literal tank a military spec war machine with a man who knew how to operate it. The big caveat here is, he had no ammunition, but due to its sheer size, weight and scale, you'd have thought he had several advantages. Marvin's Killdozer was simply a bulldozer rather than a tank, but it did have more than one foot of armour protecting itself and was equipped with several rifles. On top of this, Killdozer was actually heavier than the M60A3, weighing in at 61 tons instead of 50. And so, who would win in a fight? Marvin's Killdozer or Sean's tank? You tell me. Theories aside, the story of Sean Nelson is one that is littered with tragedy. And although it was extremely fortunate that no innocents were seriously hurt or killed, a man still lost his life. I mean, sure, people's properties were destroyed, roads were closed, and families were left without power, but nothing of significant value was lost. Sean's brother summed it up quite well. The man who died was only a shell of the person we loved. The real Sean died two years ago at the hands of drugs and alcohol. The reality is that this is probably the fairest assessment of all. Sean Nelson may have had his life ended by a bullet in 1995, but his addictions could arguably be viewed as a slow end to one's life. A man driven to desperation by some circumstances out of his control, as well as indulging in highly unhealthy behaviours. And in the end, he lost his reason and sense of self to the insatiable monster that is addiction. There is no doubt that Sean felt he was failed many times. In his mind, the army failed him by discharging him, the hospital failed him by providing inadequate care, the judicial system failed him by ruling against his lawsuits, the city failed him by cutting off his utilities, and the police harassed him by often coming to his house. His wife abandoned him by divorcing him, thieves robbed him of his livelihood, the bank was taking back his home, his latest girlfriend had just walked out, and fate, illness, or time had taken both of his parents from him. Now, there may or may not be merit to some or all of these statements, but at least Sean himself would have felt they were true. Addiction itself is a terrible thing to see or experience, and his struggles with these substances would have exacerbated a lot of these issues. The problems began to snowball as his intake increased. The more he took, the worse his life became, and the worse his life became, the more he took to cope. A vicious cycle was in motion, and spiralled ever downwards until his untimely sad demise. Normally, it's quite easy to look at a victim of a crime and see them with fondness, and equally, it's quite easy to look at a perpetrator and see them for all the terrible things that they are. Sean, though, is a rather unique case. Although he did commit multiple crimes, he saw himself as a victim. Although it wouldn't be right to absolve Sean of all of his wrongdoings, I don't think it's right to paint him as an outright villain. The truth is that, sometimes, things aren't black and white, and much like the case of Killdozer and even Sky King, opinions can be divided more than you'd expect. One thing is for sure though, Sean's sad ending can serve as a reminder to the fragility of our own happiness, and that's why I always say to you, look after each other, and look after yourself. Anyway folks, that's the end of this story. Thank you so much for being here for another video by Coffeehouse Crime, I really do appreciate you being here. So, what are your thoughts on this case? Of course, this is a little different to the usual, did you enjoy it? And also, who would win? 
Killdozer, or Sean Nelson. As mentioned before, big things are coming to this channel, but I can't actually talk about that right now. So, if you want to be the first person to hear about this, please go to copyhousecrime.com and sign up. If you liked this video, then please remember to like it, and please subscribe if you haven't yet, it really does help me out. And yeah, that's pretty much it folks, I'll see you again very soon for another video. As always said though, until we see each other again, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.